Hi, I'd like to welcome you all today to the Political Agri-Food Summit, live from Brussels, where we now have three expert speakers here to discuss EU, Africa, EU and Africa's relationship. Um, we have Carla Montisi, the Director of Planet and Prosperity at DG Devco. Hi, Carla. We also have Dominique Bergen, who I've met before, the Director of the Emergency and Rehabilitations Division at the UN's Food and Agricultural Organization. And we have Rura Miso Mashumba, the director of Manandi Africa, and quite an accomplished person in several fields. We also have you, the audience. And if you have any questions, if you'd like to participate, please feel free to message us on Slido. You just have to send us the question with the hashtag Politico Agrifood. <clears throat> we'll try to take as many as we can, and you can also take part in our online poll, which is asking the questions, well, the question, which EU measures would have the most positive effect on African food security? The theme of today's meet meeting is partnering for food security, and it's been brought into sharp relief by an unprecedented confluence of events that we've seen this year. We've had locust swarms, We've had an acceleration of climate change, we've had escalating food insecurity, and more than anything, we'd have, we've had the fall, fallout from coronavirus. I'd like to begin by asking Dominic, who has been dealing with these issues on a daily basis, um, how potentially destructive this cocktail could be when it's mixed with the macroeconomic shocks that I keep reading people saying may be on the way. I'm thinking here not just of coronavirus, there's already, I think, 1.4 million people in Africa with coronavirus, but also falling oil prices, reducing government coffers, trade ret retrenchment, a global economic slowdown. Are we prepa prepared for this? Well, thank you very much, uh, first of all, for inviting me to participate in this event and uh, I'm pleased also to be with EU colleagues uh, because we are working very closely with them. And I think one of the, the main things we are doing is indeed working on the, the evidence. I mean, try, trying to provide the evidence base of what, I mean, what is actual the type of shocks that, uh, that the continent is facing. And in that context, in April, uh, we have released uh, the fourth edition of the global report on food crisis, uh, which was uh, making it very clear that uh, prior to the uh, COVID-19 um, pandemic and even uh, prior to the to the, the measures that they've taken by the country, very important measures, but which are having an impact, we had we had 135 million people in acute food insecurity across the world. The vast majority of them, 54% of them, actually on the African continent. And prior to the, to the COVID-19 uh, crisis, they were the main drivers were conflict, extreme uh, weather events, and economic shocks, to which, as you rightly say, we can add desert locusts, but also all army one, as well as other, other shocks, such as, for example, the animal diseases that have a, high impact on the livelihood of communities like pest de petit ruminant, rift valley fevers, and others. So we see that, that this was a situation pre-COVID. Then we had the COVID and measures that were taken by the country, very important measures, but they, these measures have had an impact, especially in this uh, context of acute food insecurity, where we see that, for example, it has been much more difficult for the farmers to sell their product to the market. Therefore, they were not able to generate enough income, and this is an impact on their capacity to produce. So this today that, uh, and this of course coming in a context of high vulnerability where the level of chronic acute food insecurity was also very high prior to the crisis. So it means that in this context, it shows that initiatives such as the one we are working on with uh, the EU, uh, ECO, DEFCO, and others, the Global Network Against Food Crisis is a very important initiative to provide this evidence and from that evidence uh, to be able uh, really to work on uh, the solutions. And the solutions, they are humanitarian, but not only humanitarian. We did need to build the resilience of this community uh, to anticipate uh, the shocks, to sustain the shock, and then to be able uh, to recover from that. And, and this implies uh, an effort that is not only an FAO 
effort, that, but that is all of the, the development community effort working with the government to indeed uh, work towards building the resilience of the communities. Well, to, to, to talking specifically, to, to, to sort of bring it into focus, when you talk about African farmers not being able to sell onto the market, I mean, has coronavirus revealed any critical food supply chain issues for you, either within Africa or in terms of Africa's global connections? It's clear that uh, what we see is that, and, and we have a, a number of countries where we see that the situation has uh, massively uh, deteriorated. And again, especially these countries that had pre-existing uh, acute food insecurity uh, levels. For example, uh, we see that, but and also other factors. So it means, for example, DRC is not the largest food crisis in the world on, and on the continent, of course. Uh, but we see also that the situation has deteriorated in, in a number of countries uh, across the Sahel and, and on of Africa. Burkina Faso, for example, is a country where the level of acute food security has tripled over uh, the last uh, couple of years, uh, last couple of months, and where we see for the first time population facing a catastrophic type of situation, IPC phase 5. So it means, yes, this is extremely concerning and the disruption to the functioning of the, of the chain, of the value chain, are, are there. I mean, for example, and we, we do not talk enough of these people, the pastoralist uh, communities uh, that, you know, all the arid and semi-arid area across the, 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 the Sahel band, I mean, these people are particularly affected by the restriction in terms of movement. Transhumans cannot occur the way uh, they normally occur to find the, the type of pasture uh, they need. And this may even lead at times to uh, some conflict uh, between these communities. Okay. We're well, well, bringing in Carla at this point from DG Devco. Carla, um, it often seems that Europe only sits up and pays attention to these sort of crises in Africa um, when the people trying to escape them reach our shores. Um, what do you think the Commission should be doing that it hasn't done yet to prepare for the shocks we've been talking about just now that might be on the way? Yeah. The, the, let me say that the, um, the action that was already made by, um, by our colleague is uh, about the global network. It's an important action because this will allow us to have a common understanding on the ground analysis uh, and uh, of, of, of the disaster or, or of the crisis. And we are acting through different uh, tools. And uh, let me say that during the last five years, we are engaged in more than uh, 9 billion of euros just in supporting the agriculture, the agricultural sector. And when we look to the agricultural sector, we look also to the health sector. So now this COVID situation came and uh, let me say that we had the possibility to react very, very quickly. We were following with the FAO the results uh, of the situation, the evolution of the situation, and we tried to very quickly. So uh, as you imagine, we have uh, uh, immobilized uh, already in April uh, among, um, an amount of 15 billion of euro in response to the COVID crisis. We have adopted a sort of team Europe approach. So working together with financial institutions, member states and, uh, um, and the civil organization. And we have reached them an amount of 36 billion of euro. To do what? to do, I would say, working in everything that was related to the health sector, but also to the socioeconomic sector and also in part to the food security and, and, and the nutrition. Um, so more or less we have support the partner countries in uh, having more funds available with a support to their budgetary support to have more funds available. Uh, we have uh, keep free their fiscal space in order to be able for them to, to act uh, to face the crisis. But uh, uh, link it to also to your question. I think that this uh, uh, pandemic has also um, uh, 
demonstrate that uh, uh, there is uh, an increased risk of zoonotic disease uh, that is was at the beginning of the pandemic. So this implies that in fact we have also not just to work on the health sector, not just to work on the agricultural sector, but we need also to treat disease and so wide our approach and take into account all the underlying environment factors such as the loss of biodiversity on the habitats of wild animals so we need to bring all this part together in order to have what we are called calling an alpha approach. So taking into account what is happening in the environment, adding what is happening with our animals, adding what is the impact on the human being. So a multiple integrated approach. In terms of a multiple integrated approach, I mean, trade is one aspect of that. Um, certainly that's the case when we're talking about animals. Um, it's also the case when we're talking about commodities. And I know that DG Devco has been involved in the Sustainable Cocoa Initiative, which was just announced yesterday. Um, for those who don't know, it's, it's um, a multi-party uh, negotiating forum with Ghana and Ivory Coast, the most significant players trying to achieve um, a higher premium for cocoa, which in return um, would be delivered with guarantees of no deforestation or child labor along the supply chain. That could be backed by mandatory due diligence, labeling certification schemes, do you think, Carla, if it's successful, that that should be rolled out to other commodities? You know, soy, yes. rubber. Uh, many thanks. You have summarized the initiative on cocoa very, very, very well. And uh, could we apply it to other commodities? Uh, uh, of course, yes, we will try. Why we have started with the cocoa? Because, uh, in fact, uh, the European Union is the first importer, it's the first consumer of cocoa and the chocolate in the world. Eh? And we have two countries that will be, as you mentioned, Ghana and Ivory Coast, that they represent about 70% of cocoa you import. So, in one side, we feel a little guilty, responsible of uh, importing cocoa that it's not produced in a sustainable way. And secondly, consider that we have two key countries. We can try to test if uh, uh, this tentative to work really into the sustainability of the value chain can work. So we have started with the cocoa because two key partners and a big responsibility for, for, for Europe. And it's a clear sector where we can talk about the sustainability, take into account the three key elements of the sustainability. So in one side, the social sustainability. So as you said, tolerance zero with labor child, uh, children. Uh, we can say the sustainability of environmental sustainability because we want to try to uh, protect the, the forest or ensure a sustainable management of the forest and also the economic sustainability because we want to ensure a um, decent revenue for local farmers and in general there are small farmers. So the clear tentative is try to see if with uh, uh, multiple stakeholders uh, dialogue with uh, clear intervention on these three main domain and a strong dialogue with uh, the two countries we succeeded to improve the sustainability of uh, of this food chain on the basis of uh, this experience yes we will do tr to try to apply to other uh, commodities but it is was just you know to work concretely in one food chain because as you know in the context of the the farm to fork initiative in the context of the green deal we are thinking on a sustainable uh, management of the environment resources and uh, uh, criteria, uh, a general regulation on the good, uh, on assuring the due diligence and the good governance. But before arriving to a general legislation, a general application of the rule of due diligence, we tried to, to see if we take one commodities where we can have real impact, we can improve the sustainability of this uh, value chain in, in, in so concrete. It's a, it's a test case. I'm, I'm sorry to 
yes. interrupt. It, it's a yes, test case, sorry. and look, I will get onto the farm. To, I do want to get onto the farm to fork strategy, but just one quick question: Which commodities do you think it could be? Also, this model could also be applied to. In any case, uh, we are looking to the, the the cocoa. We are looking to apply now in in uh, in uh, in Africa, but we are thinking to also to look uh, to one other country in Africa that it's uh, Cameroon, but also to look to some countries in Latin America. Now there are different other commodities that could be applied. We are looking to the feasibility of the 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 the. the the, the applicability of one other case in this domain. But of course, there could be different commodities, but the situation will be, of course, much more complex uh, impact on many, many different countries. Okay. Well, look, mo moving things along a bit, I, I would like to bring in Ruramisu Mashumba, who's been sitting here patiently while everyone else has been talking for the last 10, 15 minutes. Um, Ruramisu, um, I'm curious as to how you experience EU agriculture policy where you are. How do you come into contact with it on the ground, whether it's through aid, training, expertise, or whether it's through the common agricultural policy and perhaps um, EU farm subsidy policy? Could, could you tell us a little bit more about how you experience um, EU agri agriculture policy? Okay. So let me begin by saying thank you um, for inviting me to this platform and to share my experiences. One thing that you didn't mention when you introduced me is that I'm a commercial farmer. I'm a commercial farmer here in Zimbabwe, and I have grown snap peas for export into the European Union. So I am a direct um, link to what, um, what policy, how policy affects um, farmers on the ground, smallholder farmers, because I started straight from university and I started growing um, export um, vegetables into the European Union. So, um, as a young person as well, um, I would say um, the opportunity to be able to grow crops and send them into the EU um, helped me get my first um, ever income from agriculture. So um, I would say that interventions between the EU and Africa really help smallholder farmers increase their yields um, in, in, through training from experts that come from um, countries like Netherlands. And all this has been facilitated because of um, good trade agreements between the EU and Africa. So it's really a good example um, to a lot of developed worlds on working with Africa. And EU definitely is a good partner in agriculture. But um, obviously this is an example of um, a good scenario, but there's lots of other um, challenges or things that we can still work towards in terms of building um, our relationship as African farmers with the European Union in order to for us to export more because Africa we've got favorable climates we have a lot of potential and um, exporting helps us um, increase our income but um, we're still seeing challenges of smallholder farmers being able to export because of very stringent um, laws which we um, as farmers um, would want to work with the EU to be able to ensure that more farmers are able to export their produce into the European Union. This year with COVID, we saw a lot of, um, I, I guess COVID, no one prepared for it, but we saw a lot of farmers, especially hot, um, the flower farmers, um, losing a lot of their produce because um, they were not able to sell and they were not protected um, from this because I guess we had ne never created um, a tool which protects farmers in, in such cases. So I think when I even look at the future, working with EU and Africa and strengthening our relationships and looking at policies, I think one of these are some of the areas we need to look at. Currently, we are, we are um, able to export crops into the European Union, but how can we increase that and be able to export much, much more food into the European Union, which helps smallholder farmers, young farmers, um, earn income um, through these favorable relationships? Okay, so when you're talking about restrictive rules, you're talking primarily about tariffs, about the ability to sell on the European markets? I think um, a lot of it has to do with um, some of the crops that we have not been able to, or produce that we've not been able to send into the European Union, have to do with um, issues to do with phytosanitation um, challenges, which um, we, I think it, they can be addressed with um, capacity building of farmers on the ground. So crops that we've been able to um, grow have had, um, we've been able to get good um, global gap certifications for them um, and be, and we've had negotiations 
where um, a buyer of vegetables is able to then train smaller holder farmers to begin to get global gap certifications because when you look at farmers in africa a lot of them are small holder farmers on small pieces of land so a loan to get a certificate for global gap it's very expensive um the, pro the processes are very difficult but looking at how can we support um, small holder farmers so that they can build their capacities and be able to also um, produce to send to the European Union. So a lot of that to do has to do with some legislations and laws that are required to export and as a small holder farmer on your own you might find these too expensive and difficult to do but um, with support from um, with instruments that support um, rural farmers helping them increase their income we can see a dramatic um, drop in, in food insecurity because uh, farmers want to earn good, um, good money and in, a good income. And a lot of the times with a lot of these horticulture crops, they pay really well, uh, really favorable returns for farmers. But how can we make sure that we do not leave any anyone behind? Um, there are so many farmers who, who have mastered growing certain vegetables, which are required into the European Union, but making sure that they are able to get these certifications, not having to fly in um, expensive experts as a, a smallholder farmer who's already earning less than a dollar a day. You can imagine that is impossible, but I think with when we strengthen our relationships, we'll be able to do much, much more. I wonder if there's an issue there, because I mean, certainly in terms of SPS rules, avocados have to be the right size, the right shape. They have to meet a number of um, conditions to actually um, enter the EU market. And is the scenario where perhaps it's, it doesn't always, it's not always in the EU's interest to, to, to increase competition um, externally? I, I don't know. Um, Dominique, do you think this is an area where there should be more international assistance? But it's not that there should be, there is, as a matter of fact. I mean, when, when you know, I was talking of this, uh, this initiative that we, I think, uh, were working uh, with, for example, DEFCO on the, on the PROACT program, I mean, the, the, the pro-resilience uh, action. I mean, we, are, we have a, a diversified uh, portfolio. And, and the idea, you know, that, as I was saying, in the context of the global network, we identify the... the, the the hot spots, so to say, and then we try to identify what are the the re uh, tailor uh, solutions that should be posed to the communities on the ground. And 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 this is, I mean, this shows that in in our case we see that there is no one size fits all. That we need to have an in depth analysis of the situation, working with the communities to indeed address their needs in the best possible way. And then. Uh, Typically, what you do, for example, as part of the, the resilience portfolio uh, we have with the, with the EU, it's to, it's to essentially uh, uh, diversify the production, but also exactly promoting the type of, uh, of training. I mean, we have many uh, different approaches to, uh, to, to, to training. We are also working the, with, with the government to make sure that the, the right type of agricultural inputs are, are made available uh, to the communities that that there is also training on on processing new additions you know that there are many uh, losses in the in the value chain how can we uh, reduce those losses and then and then besides working with the communities uh, try to work also uh, with the with the government in these countries to make sure that for example through a program like the first that the right measures are the right policy measures are being uh, are being promoted and are, are made available uh, to the government in this country so it's really a multifaceted uh, type of support that is i would say uh, contributing to to create uh, uh, an environment that is favorable uh, of course for the for the small orders and that is contributing to uh, building their resilience it's, re it's reassuring to hear that perhaps that that, that SPS issue is, is less widespread that, than um, Rura Misu was suggesting. What I hear a lot of the time um, from when I'm talking to diplomats um, is that the issue of common agricultural policy subsidies um, is still um, um, a, 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 a itch that can't be scratched for, for many of them. Um, whether it's subsidies on dairy or livestock or the injection of palm oil into milk powder or soft wheat exports, allegations of dumping. Um, do you think that the EU still 
um, has some work to do to put its house in order where um, its trade relations in Africa and its use of cap subsidies are concerned. Should, should I repeat the question? I guess this, this is not addressed to me. Yes, it was. I, I was asking you about cap subsidies. And it's a trade justice question, I suppose. Yeah, well, but to be honest, this is not uh, my field. Uh, and really, so I would not venture into that direction. OK, fair enough. Is there anyone else who has any thoughts about cap subsidies in this area? No? OK, well, let's move on in that case. Um, Carla, can I come ask you about another area that the EU has been working on, which is the farm to fork strategy, the biodiversity strategy, ultimately the Green Deal. Um, this could involve a range of new domestic targets covering pesticides, potentially fertilizers, organic farming. Um, what effect do you think they could have on Europe's relations with Africa agriculturally? Many thanks. And so sorry, but I the the communication was interrupted. So I I lost the the last question, the last part of the conversation. But uh, I can see that uh, we we are in in a new in a new question. So uh, let me say about the farm to fork. Um, um, what will be the impact uh, on on Africa? You you are asking, and uh, let me say that uh, first of all, uh, the the farm to fork strategy is predominantly development for the use of the European Union, of course. Uh, but of course, there will be implication also in the relation with uh, with Africa, and the implication might be at. I would say at three levels. Uh, first, uh, the farm to fork strategy really wants to move from the traditional central way uh, in which we have development our policy. Uh, so uh, the, the clearer point is to move, to look to the food system in a manner. So to look to the food, look into the source of the food, to the human body, look to the, the I would say, to the environment health, the human health, the public health, and starting, of course, with the production. The second part will be uh, the idea of to improve the quality, quality of food, the quality of diets, so quality in the way of food is, is produced. And of course, one of the key points will be the reduction of the dependency on pesticide and uh, on uh, antimicrobials uh, to reduce excess fertilization, to increase organic farming, and and etc. So there will be a um, huge opportunity for a green economic growth, just uh, improving the quality of all all the work. The third element will be uh, clearly the idea. Yeah, that of course we want to look at to Europe, we want also to look at the global level because the idea behind Europe to improve the, the, the food of the system also are. I think we've lost you, Carla. Are we having a problem technically here? I think so. Okay, um, well, we're remiss, I mean, again, from, from the, where you are in Africa, in Zimbabwe, do you welcome the EU's new focus on sustainable farming? Um, I, I do. I, I, I believe that the future in agriculture, future in agriculture is all about sustainability. And um, we need to be sustainable throughout the whole value chains. As farmers, we need to be sustainable some methods of farming that we practiced some years ago um, are not longer sustainable. We, you know, um, I'm happy to see Dominic here from the FAO because I'm actually part of their Johannesburg um, Resilience um, Committee on, on Conservation Agriculture. We need to start looking at um, conservation agriculture as one of the tools to adapt in agriculture. You know, here in Zimbabwe, very few people are using conservation agriculture because there are some, of, some challenges that they see in um, yield reduction in the first year and because we're too, too much subsistent farmers farmers are not willing to um, to lose yield even in the first year 
you know, things like crop rotation is, is important, even when we're looking at um, using of clean energy. So I think these are some of the things when I had an earlier discussion um, on conservation agriculture with some colleagues and the challenge again on the continent is that we're using of um, green energy and all, all these practices, there is no support um, to from any other partners to, to because there is there, there is a cost and a lot of the times the cost goes to the farmer and people ex, people are wanting to for us to, to have a better planet a greener planet especially with pandemics like COVID we are becoming more aware of um, of that whatever we do on one part of the world affects other other parts of the world so therefore um, we need to think about building resilient communities we need to think about um, be, um, our practices looking at a better models of, of agriculture um, for the future. So I think there's a lot to talk there. And again, uh, maybe these are some of the um, initiatives um, EU and Africa can look at by when they buy produce from Africa, how can they support farmers who are producing, not to just produce at low cost, but if they're producing sustainably, uh, customers willing to pay more for that. I think that's where the underlining is. If the customers are willing to pay more for sustainably grown produce, then farmers would be easy to adapt. But to expect farmers to to produce still at the same cost is not sustainable. Well, exactly. And and what what mechanism do you, do you think might be able to, to facilitate that? I mean, we talked earlier about the Sustainable Cocoa Initiative. Do we need effectively a series of sustainable commodity initiatives um, going across the board here to actually uh, allow the transition to take place in a way that doesn't drive farmers um, out of business everywhere. Absolutely, absolutely. We need to. Act. If we want sustainable produce, we want sustainable food. It's gonna, it's gonna cost more to produce. I need to think: Is the end user going to pay, or are there going to be um, other players who are going to pay that cost? Because right now the cost is expected to be paid by the farmer not you know we need to look at at, at at something that's more sustainable something that's more realistic who pays that cost for sustainability okay well i was one i would like to bring in uh dominic here to uh, for your thoughts Dom. and also I've, we've got a couple of questions coming in one on the, the farm to fork strategy um which is saying how could it concretely help climate adaptation in africa's food systems and what's the role for food trade? Do you have any thoughts there? Well, I'm not sure I, I got the question fully, but I mean, what is, uh, what is important here is, and following up on the uh, on, uh, Romiso uh, point, I think really what we are trying to do is to uh, provide uh, African farmers, because remember where I started the conversation, started the conversation by saying that uh, basically African farmers are uh, confronted with a variety of shocks. I mean, and that it is therefore becoming, I mean, uh, you know, we were referring to climate extremes, we were referring to, uh, to in a number of countries, uh, conflict, we were referring uh, to even the past, you yourself were referring to the to the locals. So, so it, it's really about, about making sure that, that we equip them to, to cope uh, with the situation. And uh, I like Aurora uh, Miso was referring to, uh, to for example, uh, conservation farming. Conservation farming is something that we have been supporting for, for decades uh, in Africa uh, with demonstrated results. But I would say this is just one of the, of the many measures uh, which uh, which we are promoting, and as part of our of our role, uh, the the I mean, what we are trying to, to do is to uh, really document the the variety of good practices that are that are developed first and foremost by the by the farmers themselves, and then to I would say see how we can add the the innovation part of it, how we can further and reach them and then make them available to a, to a broader range of, of farmers. And we see that, uh, for example, uh, the work we do on, on this risk reduction in this country is, uh, is yielding uh, significant results. On average, we consider that, that the, the return, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the return investment is 
five times higher than in using these good practices than if you use standard practices. So, and of course, all this can be related to trade because if, if you are more predictable, a production of more predictable quality, then immediately you become more competitive. So it is a, it is a very much a virtual circle in which we need to enter. And and as part of that, it's clear that the building the resilience of these communities is absolutely fundamental. Well, one other question, Dom, I'd just like to ask you, which because it's just come in, um, somebody said. How about selling pesticides that are forbidden in the EU to Africa, amongst others? Is that something you have any thoughts well, about? I think, I think, I think FAO is. Uh, I think FAO is one of the, the agency that is. Uh, I would say the more the more strict uh, when it comes to the the use of pesticides. We use uh, pesticides in the countries that are uh, that are registered in the. These countries, we are we are the one. Uh, I mean, we are the one uh, recommending the, the global uh, standards in that. And more and more, what we see, for example, in the control, for example, in the in the desert locust operations, what we see is that uh, we are more and more promoting the use of uh, biopesticides that are essentially based on on, on fungi. So so it means that definitely our our trend is. Uh, going to be yeah, is, is very, very environmental friendly and, and it's really as a solution of last resort that we use the pesticides. Okay. And and Ruramiso, I mean if there is if there was one thing which the you would you would like to see the European Commission do which could help you with the greatest challenges you're facing at the moment, whether it's coronavirus, climate change um, market access issues, whatever. What is the one thing that, you, the, that the Commission could really do that would be helpful to African farmers? Ooh, okay. Um, I'll say the one thing that the European Commission could do to help um, African farmers is look at um, instruments that support smallholder farmers to be able to export more of their produce into the European Union. Hey, that's, that's very clear and, and very concise. Um, thanks very much to you and to Dominique and to Carla. Um, all of you um, in, have been most enlightening in difficult circumstances as things have turned out. Um, thanks also to the audience for joining us and for taking part, um, if you did take part in the online poll and in the questions. Um, I'm sure this is uh, a subject which is going to go on. Um, the discussions will go on for, for, for many months to come, but we've, we've got a lot of food for thought out of this uh, meeting this afternoon. So with that, um, I think we're going to say uh, goodbye from uh, Brussels for now. <laughs>